So here's something that I discovered on my self-help healing journey just today. Part of my childhood trauma involves money. Now, the Bible teaches the love of money is the root of most evil, okay? Wanting, okay, first let's decide what, how we're going to define love, okay? What is love? We throw love around. Narcissists throw love around like it's a generic term. We got to stop that. We love pizza. We love chocolate bars. Oh, I love that fancy dress. Oh, I love that car. Why are we attaching feelings to inanimate objects? This is what the love of anything that is inanimate is the root of most evil. When you put a love for something, a devotion towards something that can't give that back to you. Oh, I'm seeing narcissism here. Hmm. Hmm. Oh, okay. I'm going off topic here just for a second because this is a good thought. You know how the narcissists objectify their targets? or AKA their victims, they treat us as objects when they are the object themselves. They are projecting, oh my goodness, this is good stuff. They are projecting that objectification that they know themselves to be, they are turning that onto us and they objectify us. And they treat us with no feeling because you're not supposed to treat an object with feeling. So we can learn from them. Just gonna have a sip of my shake. Mm, hopefully my lips don't turn purple or blue. I got a blueberry shake going on here. Um, we can learn from the narcissist. They objectify people. They show us no feeling, but yet they show inanimate objects feeling. They've got it backwards. And so when God says the love of money is the root of most evil, well, you can put that to any inanimate object. The love of cars is the root of most evil. The love of clothes is the root of most evil. The love of gaming is the root of most evil. The love of beauty products is the love of most evil. The love of clothing is the root of most evil. When we attach emotion to things that have no meaning, I don't, oh, maybe I do. I do. Oh, I don't. Okay. I got a quarter here. I got a quarter. Okay. I got a quarter here. When we attach love to money, <clears throat> think of this little quarter as the narcissist. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Look at it and go, oh, I love you. You give to me. No, it doesn't. This is just a means to get what you want. This is an object. This quarter is an object. Are we supposed to love objects? No. We're supposed to <clears throat> love people and animals 
and respect God's creation, respect the trees, the flowers, love the birds, love all life. We are supposed to put our emotion into life. We're not supposed to put our emotion into this. But is this bad? If I have no emotion towards this, is this bad? Is it now evil? No, because it's my emotion that I invest into this. It's my emotion, my intent that I invest that causes me to do bad things. It's not this. It's not the coin itself. So think about that. The narcissist, ah, let me grab this. The narcissist who is like money, who is like the coin, who is the object, who projects their, their knowing that they are the object because they have no feeling. Uh, money has no feeling. Narcissists are like money. They have no feeling. And narcissists project their objectification onto us. They may inherently subconsciously know that they're an object and they project that onto us to create in us the object, to make us the object. And so they approach us with no feeling. And that is how they can use us to their will. We use money to our will. I never thought of it this way, folks. This is just coming to me today, right now, real time with you. Thank you, Jesus. So the love of money, yeah, that's evil. But money in itself is not inherently evil. It's what you do with money that makes money evil. If you hold money in high regard where you love it, and it can't love you back, my friends. You've got a narcissistic relationship with money. And that type of relationship can be reflected back to how we, the targets of narcissism, are objectified just in the same way we objectify or idolize money, not objectify excuse me we are supposed to objectify money we're supposed to have it in a, its proper place we're supposed to objectify money and honor and love life but we this world that is so full of narcissism and is narcissistic has us doing it backwards we objectify life and honor money so just think about this. I was switching back and forth between money and narcissism here because there's a huge metaphor that I never got until now. So thank you. So speaking about narcissists, when narcissists objectify us, they are putting their feeling into us. And what is their feeling? Their feelings are everything negative. And they are trying to coerce us in a negative path to do negative things, to do what they want us to do. Just like how with money, we put money on a path to spend. We use money to spend on certain things. We use money and the outcome of using that money is what we get back that we love or what we like or what we want or need. You see how money is used objectively, should be used objectively to fulfill an, a need, but instead we end up imparting all our emotion into money and money can't give us back emotion. So we buy things that superficially bring us joy, bring us clarity, bring us happiness, bring us elation, whatever the feelings may be, but that's fleeting. And we need more money to fill that up. The narcissist is using people as a commodity. Wow. Wow. 
Oh my goodness, suddenly a light bulb just went off. Oh, sorry, you see the inside of my cup. That's my blueberry stuff. Mm. Sorry, blueberry shake. Um, yeah. Pretty insightful. And this all started from me talking. They must be having a day at the park from school. Um, that's actually the special needs people. That's who they are. They take uh, a break from school and they come to the park that's right behind me. So that's what, if you heard some people making noise, that's who it is. So they're a good bunch of people, let me tell you. I go for walks and I see them and oh, there's just, they brighten your day. So when you go out, you know, just, I'm just going to take a sideline. Just brighten someone else's day just by smiling at them. Can you do that for me, please? Thanks. Okay, so all of this chat started with money mantras, money and for affirmations, because um, I feel like I have a roadblock. And most of us do have roadblocks, and we've been taught as Christians, oh, money is the root of most evil. Well, as I just explained to you, hopefully you get it, that it's not money itself money is an inanimate object it doesn't hold any feelings so how can it be good or evil it's our intent that makes it good or evil and so this is a for me money has been a part of my trauma and so i've uprooted mommy and daddy issues sister issues sibling issues I've uprooted the trauma of being abandoned and rejected and I'm feeling good, but there's just another roadblock. And what is that? That's not being taught properly about money. I can earn money. I can spend money. I can save money. It's fine. However, <clears throat> there's just a roadblock. And... This roadblock is preventing me from reaching my potential and going where I want to in my vocation, in my career, in what the future that I see for myself. So I started doing affirmations on money because self-love affirmations for me have helped me and they've helped me blossom. I encourage you to do it. I have affirmations set on godly principles. 1 Corinthians chapter 13 verses 4 through 8. That's what I do. And that's just, it's just, mm, thank you, Jesus. Um, so I have was doing these affirmations and I've been, I've made my own money affirmations and I've sleep with them in my earbuds at night so I go to sleep hearing my voice low and I fall asleep so that I get that in my subconscious because uh, that's how you do it and it works I didn't have a mommy and a daddy teach me how to be courageous in spending money how to be bold and stepping out and doing what you want <clears throat> and taking a chance with money and taking a chance with my ideas and my creativity. I didn't have that. So I'm coming to you guys now. There are many Christians out there who will say that affirmations are of the enemy. Well, I'm sorry to say, no, they're not. Um, you can use anything that is intended for good for bad. Energy cannot be created or destroyed. Energy can be positive or negative. It's your intent that makes it positive or negative. So if people, Christians who are going to say that saying positive affirmations at night, money is affirmations and self-love affirmations and I am affirmations and all that, people who want to call that bad, okay, I'm going to say this boldly, 
check what you watch on TV. If you're going to call people out on affirmations, then you darn well better turn off the TV and stop watching TV because I can guarantee you that what you're watching on TV is getting into your subconscious just like how affirmations do. And the TV is swaying your mind. Jesus tells us that what you think about is as if you've already done. Take a look at the scripture of him talking about the adulterer. So people who want to watch their TV, want to watch vampire shows and murder shows, rape shows, um, espionage, drug running, you know, uh, even killing in defense. You want to watch those and call that entertainment? God says otherwise. It's as if you've already done it. So you're a sinner just by watching those shows. So please do not call anybody out on affirmations are evil no they're not the TV is more evil it's the intent that is behind those affirmations and if you use those affirmations to better yourself what harm is it going to do really God says he has plans to prosper you not harm you plans for good he has plans for good There are 72 books taken out of scripture. What those 72 books of the Bible contain, we're not sure. What if they were filled with affirmations of Jesus himself? We have his very words. You can do everything that I've done and more. Isn't that encouraging? What if you put that in an affirmation at night and listen to that? Jesus says you can do the, what he has done and more. What if you put that on repeat and listen to that at night to get that into your heart, to get you to believe it? How is believing in good things bad? It's not. So I was sitting here today <clears throat> going through these affirmations and I came across an affirmation talking about my bank account. Ah, here it is. The affirmation was, I have no fear of money. Money does not control me. I control money how I spend it and how I save it. I have the exact amount of money in my bank account right now that I want and need. And when I said the word bank account, I felt I was self-aware and I felt a little shiver of fear. So I paused my affirmations and I looked out into the sky and I said, God, what is it that I'm fearing? I should be joyful that I've got money in my bank account. Finally, after living this time of lack with COVID, finally I'm getting money in my, my bank account. I'm, I'm happy. Why am I fearful? So God says this, it's not your bank account that you fear. It's not money that you fear. It's the feeling of what it feels like to be in lack that you fear. And I said, well, I'm not afraid of being in debt anymore because I'm in debt. So I want to get out of debt. And God says, it's not that. It's you're afraid of living in lack. And I'm like, but I'm living in lack. And he's like, yes. And this is a repeated pattern. 2010, you went through the economic crisis and your family suffered for two years. You're going through another economic crisis and two years you're suffering again. Let's look at that. I'm like, okay, God, let's look at that. I'm going to go until my battery, my battery just said I'm running low on my phone. So I'm going to go until my battery runs out. So I've got to be quick here. So I said, I'm not afraid of living in lack because I'm living in lack. And he's like, yes. But let's look at this when you get money you know what living in lack feels like and that's as soon as you get money you know that you're gonna spend it and you fear living in lack 
you fear spending it because you know spending it means that you don't have it. And if you don't have it, you're living in lack. And that's what you're fearing. You're fearing this living in lack, what it feels like. And I said, well, I can't accept it because accepting it means that I'm just going to live like this more. He goes, no, accepting doesn't mean accepting. Like, okay, I'm just going to live like this forever. This is what you want from me, God. That's not the type of acceptance he wants. God wants you to submit. Submit to your circumstances. Submit to it. Stop resisting it. Accept the day as it is and live in good cheer and look to the unseen. Even though you're going through lack, look to the unseen of where you have abundance where you have prosperity. Focus on God's word of, I have plans to prosper you, not harm you. Look to that when you're living in lack because that is submitting. You're not fighting. You're not resisting the environment that you're in. And so I said, okay, God, I can do that. So if I'm not living in lack anymore because I'm not resistant to it, then what am I really afraid of? He goes, you're afraid of the fear. The fear itself that comes from living in lack. That's what you're fearing. You're fearing fear. Hmm. Don't they say the only thing left to fear is fear itself? Don't fear fear. Eradicate it. By looking to the better things that are unseen that have yet to come into your life. Look to the spiritual, the wants, the desires. I want money. I don't want to live in lack. So in my unseen, I'm not living in lack. And that gives you the hope for a future. And that segues into the love letter that God gave me. 12 years ago and I will share that with you in another video. Be blessed.